Hello, everyone. Welcome to Skills for High School Success. And this is part one. And this is the APH Virtual Excel Academy. And again, part one, which means we'll have part two in a week and part three two weeks from now. So I'm going to turn this over immediately to our hosts and our instructors, Jennifer Stelmack and Amber Happ. So go ahead, Jennifer and Amber. Hi, everyone. My name is Amber Happ. I'm a TVI in o and from North Carolina. I am a white female. I have brown hair and glasses. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Stelmack, and I am a TVI from Northeast Florida. And I, too, am a Caucasian female, and I've got brown hair high up in a bun today. So before we get started today, we're going to go over some quick rules. First, if you would like to unmute, you need to have been called on and have a quiet background. Raise your digital hand if you have a question. You have to join with a name. If you do not join with a name, we will rename you. This helps the teachers know who everyone is. And I do know that we have a school joining us, so that is perfect how you guys are already labeled. Also, the chat will only be open when we say so, and this helps those who are using the screen reader be able to focus on the teachers and um, not what is in the chat box. Also, don't forget that this session will be recorded. So if you miss something or need to go back and listen again, it'll be available so that you can participate at your own pace. Also, there will be an optional extension activity to put what you learned today into action. And when we do open the chat, guys, make sure you change your to box to everyone and not just to host and panelists, or only Amber and myself are going to see it and everyone else won't be able to see all your wonderful ideas. Great. Thank you for mentioning that. So skills for high school success. Our topic today is about learning skills and tricks for organizing your home, school materials, work items, and schedule with or without a visual impairment. These skills are beneficial to learn to best streamline your life and make you the most efficient possible. So by the end of today's session, you will have a couple I can statements. I can demonstrate an understanding of three to five new skills for organizing my daily life and I can demonstrate the benefits and downsides of using different organizational strategies in my daily life. So let's share, let's get the ball rolling. On a scale of one to five, how organized are you? One being not organized at all, or five being very, very organized. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Johnny is a five, Anne is a one. Anybody else? John I think that five. Oh, Garrett, I'm probably a four. I'm a little bit better than average, but I there's room for improvement. <laughs> And for our kids that are at the high school, we've got a five, a two, a four, a four, and a four. They got a whole range over there. Nice. Real so quick, while you guys have the chat up, can you tell us what grade you're in? That way we kind of have an idea who we're working with today. Eighth grade, homeschool, ninth and twelfth graders. Donnie just graduated. Awesome. So we have eighth grade through just graduated. So we've got a whole range of kids. So a lot, you guys should be able to use this a lot. Awesome. Now that we know where everybody is at, let's keep going. So steps for success, successful students and adults are organized and it is never too early or too late to start organizing your life. 
Being organized can help you stay focused, save time searching for things, reduce stress, and be successful. So another question, let us know in the chat, what do you want to learn about organization today? Is there anything specific that you're just eager to know more about? Donnie said all of it, um, how to organize a backpack successfully. That's a good one. Organizing emails, how to do stuff electronically. We're gonna touch on that a little bit today, John Paul. Um, we're gonna get a little bit more into the technology side of it next week, um, so make sure if you learn a little bit today about it, you come back next week to get all the electronic options too. Great, so now that we know a little bit more about our goals, we're gonna start with calendars, planners, agendas, date books, they go by many things, but basically these are all typically represented by a chart that shows the days, weeks, months of the year. They can be digital or paper-based. And I just have a quick question. If you use a calendar or planner, go ahead and write what kind you use. I'm very curious because personally I use, I actually use both. I use digital for some things and I use a paper-based for um, other events. Or if you don't use one, what would you like to use? I am all electronic. I hate paper anything. <laughs> <laughs> We have an electronic person. Anne uses both. We got Google Calendar, that's a really good one. Does anyone have like a school email account that came with a planner that they might use? Or a Teams page maybe? I know Teams is really popular right now. Digital paper, digital because paper base is hard. Yeah, paper base is hard to keep up with. That is for sure. Seems like a good mix. So, what kind is best for you? Is it digital? Is it paper based? Let's go over the pros and cons of each. So digital calendars or planners or agendas, whatever you'd like to call them, um, digital based options can schedule things over a specific time. And if you have events overlap, you will be notified. This has saved me in the past because I may use my digital calendar and schedule something for a certain time. And then after I go and um, schedule, I get notified that, oh, I already have something going on on that time and date. So that is a helpful feature. You can quickly find events with the search feature. This has also been a lifesaver. Um, I may schedule something in my calendar and forget what day it's on, but I know that I can do a quick search and I uh, will be able to find what day and time that it does occur. You can also sync events with your email. This is nice because anytime you get an email and if you're using the calendar that is associated with that email, it will put those events on your calendar after you accept them. Um, they also can be free with an email account. You don't have to purchase anything to get a digital calendar. You can also share your calendar with other people so that they have access to it. This could be helpful if you're sharing a calendar with a parent or a family member, um, just so that they know what you have scheduled or maybe so you know what they have scheduled. You can also set up custom reminders so that you get an alert on your phone or computer of an upcoming event. 
this is also a really helpful one. And I admit that I've forgotten events, but when I get that notification 15 minutes before something starts, I rush and I'm like, oh, I won't be late. I've got it covered. And what's nice about this is that you can set custom reminders. So you can set a reminder for maybe an hour before an event starts or two hours or whatever works best for you. Um, the one of the drawbacks of having a digital system would be that it requires access to a phone or a computer or a braille note. So now that we talked about some of the pros and cons of digital based systems let's talk about paper based. So for paper based calendars or planners, you can have a custom themed one, they are available um, in lots of different things, so I think i've had a cat calendar the past few years. Um, so if you have a certain topic that you like you can get a custom one. You can also mark these with stickers highlight or write events in different colors. You can mark through tasks that you have completed. This is probably one of the most satisfying things about having a paper calendar for me, at least, is once I've finished something and successfully completed it, I mark through that uh, event so I know it's done. I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's very satisfying. <laughs> There's also fewer distractions than using a digital device. It happens to me a lot that I may think that I need to add something to my calendar or add a reminder and I open my phone and it just goes out of my head and I forget what I need to do and I get sidetracked going on social media or playing games or going on the internet. So if you have a paper calendar or paper planner, you know there are fewer distractions because it really only serves uh, one purpose that you open it and you write down or braille what you need to do in it. Um, for paper-based calendars, there's also no technology skills required. So if you are still working on those tech skills, you can um, not have to worry about um, not knowing all the keyboard shortcuts or things that you need to know just yet. So if you're still learning those, this has no skills required. Um, you can also use a slate and stylus with paper calendars or planners. Um, but with a paper calendar, you, it does need to be replaced yearly, or sometimes they do every 18 months, so that's something to keep in mind. Also, they can be misplaced or lost. Um, if you're somebody that easily loses things or forgets where you put them, this may not be the best option for you. Um, and that it also does not require access to a phone or a computer or the internet. So that is another plus. So there's lots of things to consider when you're trying to pick out, do I want to use an electronic calendar planner or is paper based better for me? One con to me of paper is that I can't set up a recurring event because that is a feature that I use regularly, especially for birthdays, family birthdays that I want to know every year. I've got it set up for like the next 15 years just to show up in my calendar <laughs> on the same day. And then stuff that's weekly. If I have a student that I see every week or if I have appointments set or once a month, you can set those up to be recurring and then you don't have to go in and specifically input it every single time. That's a great point. It saves time having to uh, not do that every time that the event comes up. So now that we've talked about some different pros and cons of paper and digital, which do you prefer after you've learned about a little bit about them? Go ahead and write that in the comments. You can hit D for digital or P for paper. See if we changed any minds. We got a D, we've got a D and a P. Someone said it depends. They're probably a both kind of person. How do, and then John Paul asked, how do we bridge the gap between sighted users and blind users? So we, it's gonna be very different whether you're being a paper-based user or a digital user. Um, for digital users, luckily our screen readers and software does pretty well with most of the major apps. There are definitely still some glitches in it. Um, Actually, can we do a quick poll real quick and just let us know how many of you are Braille users and how many of you are low vision? So we kind of have an idea what our audience is.
Donnie, okay, low vision. <clears throat> We got four braille and one low vision in another group. All right, so we're looking kind of half and half right now. Um, if you were going to do a paper-based calendar as a braille user, more than likely you, if you were carrying it around to keep notes, a slate and stylus is definitely gonna be your most mobile option. Um, you could definitely sit down like once a year when you get your new calendar to input like the stuff you know is going to come yearly. Um, but then for like the day-to-day -day inputs, you're going to have to carry that pesky slate and stylus. Um, for our low vision users, we would, I mean, my suggestion most of the time would be to use just your screen reading um, or your Zoom features and stuff on your phone or computer. And the really cool thing about digital stuff is once you're logged into your account, if you log in on your phone or your computer or another computer, it's gonna go across all the different devices as long as you're logged in with the same one. So if I add a calendar event from my email on my computer, when that calendar event comes up, it shows up on my phone and on my watch. And sometimes even on my car, if I'm in the car and it's Bluetooth connected, I'll get all the notifications everywhere. <laughs> That's my favorite in the car when I get notified about my events. <laughs> so there are lots of options um, and we're going to go into those a little bit more now. So what exactly goes on a planner? Uh, there's a fine line between including too much and too little. So we're going to talk about those. So definitely you want to include due dates of quizzes, tests, and projects. And be specific. Don't just put test. Maybe add it's a math test on chapter four so that you know exactly what it is on. Dates and times of extracurricular activities such as games, clubs, performances, or events. And if you are doing maybe um, an event like a game or goal ball, you put the, the time that it's happening and where. Is it a home game or is it an away game? Deadlines for permission forms, scheduling tests, buying spirit wear. As a high schooler, you have tests that are coming up, standardized ones. So it's important that you know when the deadline is for scheduling those tests. So that is something that you definitely want to include in a planner or a calendar. Homework assignments. Again, here you want to be specific. Instead of just writing science homework, go ahead and put what pages you're supposed to read for your science homework or um, what worksheets you're supposed to complete. Because you may remember when you're writing it down, but it's a whole nother story when you're at home and you open up your planner or you open your uh, digital calendar and you just have science homework. You want to be specific so that you remember exactly what it is and you know what it is when it's time to do it. Any irregularities or changes in your normal schedule? So maybe every night before school, you pack your lunch because you, you bring lunch to school, but um, there could be a pizza party or something. So if there's something that's different in your normal schedule, go ahead and write that in the calendar. Or if you have a club meeting after school, so instead of riding the bus home, you have someone picking you up. So it's important to put any changes in your normal schedule. Countdown to important events if you need reminders. If you're somebody that likes to have those, um, those countdowns like to a test, put that in there. Maybe five days to your English test and then four days, three days. That can help you um, just with your, your scheduling. Birthdays or holidays, definitely go ahead and put those on your calendar. Doctor appointments. If you have a doctor's appointment in the morning and you're going to miss your first or second class of the day, uh, you definitely want to include that so you remember to ask a classmate or your teacher for any work that you've missed. IEP dates. These happen every year. You've got annual. Sometimes they happen more than once a year. It's important to know when those are so that you can be present. But there are a few things that we don't want to add to a planner or a calendar. Um, and those are events that are the same every day. You want to consider uh, 
visual clutter if you're a low vision student. So if you have too much on your planner, try and cut back on some of the things that you add. And the same can be for if you're a screen reader user and you have events that are the same every single day, you may not need to include those because they aren't changing. Also private information. If it's something that other people shouldn't know, it shouldn't go on your planner. And the same thing with passwords. Um, we don't wanna add those to any planners or calendars just to protect yourself so that um, it doesn't go into the wrong hands or somebody that um, shouldn't have it has it. So some accessible paper options. For low vision students, we've got large print monthly calendars, um, daily and weekly planners. These are from APH. And you can also get a regular print monthly calendar or a daily and weekly calendar and use magnification for these. And if you need um, some help with getting your visual attention, you can use highlighters or stickers to draw your attention. Um, I like using highlighters in my planner um, so that I can easily see things that I need to. And for braille options for paper-based calendars or planners, there are monthly calendars from APH that are braille. And there are also um, braille weekly date books from APH. And these are pretty cool. It's like a tiny little binder and it's in a three ring binder. So you can open it and take pages out and put it in a braille writer, or you can leave it in there and use the slate and stylus and you can braille your events that are happening in that. So for Everybody, there are lots of options, lots of options. So some accessible digital options. The reminder app. I use this all the time. It's free on iPhones and you can use voiceover or Siri to set reminders and they can include dates, times, locations and priorities. Um, I'll use this all the time. Just when I'm in a quick rush, I, I'll ask my phone to set a reminder to put the clothes in the dryer or put the, the, um, uh, my lunch out for the night before, things like that. So you can do this for schoolwork. You can say, remind me to study when I get home at four o'clock. So this is very versatile and there's lots of things that you can use it for. You can do similar with the Alexas too. Yeah, so you have stuff around your house. That's another way for organization and it'll go into your list of reminders in your Alexa app if it's set up in your account. That's a great one, because then if you're just in your bedroom and you don't have your phone near you or you can just ask her to set your reminder for things. I use that a lot, too. I'm glad you mentioned that. There's also the VO calendar, and this is a paid app that's designed specifically to be used with voiceover. Um, and it also has large print and it can record voice memos. So this app is pretty cool. It's um, super accessible with voiceover and it's everything that a calendar or planner can do. It has all the options that you need. And if you are low, if you do have low vision, you can also access this too. Uh, Gmail calendar, Outlook calendar. I'm sure there are lots of other accessible options, but these are just two that I've included. And you can use screen reading software like VoiceOver, Chromevox, NVDA, JAWS, ZoomText. All of those are accessible with Gmail and Outlook. Does anyone else use any other calendar systems that are accessible with um, screen reading software or magnification? I'm just curious. You can raise your hand or put it in the chat. We had the question, how much is the VO calendar cost? And it is a $3.99 download app. Um, just gonna... I don't see anything that says anything about having to require a subscription afterwards. So I think it's just once you buy the app, you are good to go. I believe that's right, yeah. Um, and then we've got someone who uses an Apple calendar and then someone who uses their Outlook and Google calendars. Cool. And I'm sure there's lots of other options out there. You kind of just have to trial and error what works best for you. And sometimes it's based on where you're working or where your, what your school uses. Because if your school is Google-based and uses Google Classroom and all those features, 
you're probably better off to stick with a Gmail and Google Calendar because then everything's going to link together. Whereas like my district is a Microsoft district. So we use everything Microsoft, including Outlook. And so everything, my Teams, my um, Outlook, my Word, my OneNote, all of that ties together. So it all can sync and I get all the information everywhere I need it. So quick knowledge check. What have you learned about organizing your schedule or your calendar so far? You can raise your hand or write it in the chat. Anybody? I know we've gone over a lot, so maybe you're just taking it in. Um, Donnie, she was just asking, what have you learned about organizing your schedule so far? Um, someone said that they should put assignments you have to do in your calendar. Maybe if we do a yes, no type question. Who yeah. learned a new type of calendar that might be available that they could check out? You guys can either raise your hand or put a Y in the chat, whatever is easier for you. And I can clear the hands after. Someone learned about the uh, VO calendar. Someone learned about the Google calendar. And then John Paul said, I'm an eighth grader. How do I find out what platform my school calendar is based on? Um, so your best bet is probably to ask one of your teachers or your TVI. They should be able to tell you what platform that their that your district uses because it's so different district to district that I wouldn't dare answer. Try and guess what you guys are using. The one way you would know is if by any chance your email said at gmail.com or something or at microsoft.com or at office.com then that might give us kind of a clue at the end, but otherwise it's probably at so-and-so school district and you would just have to ask your TVI probably. All right, let's keep it going. So now that we've talked about organizing your schedule and events that are happening in your life, let's talk about organizing your daily life. So, Number one, take responsibility of your belongings. To be organized in your physical life or at home, you need to be responsible for the things that you own or the things that you have or are using. Only you can keep yourself organized. Mom can't, dad can't, your TBI can't. It is your responsibility and um, only really only you can do it. To be successful, you need to be organized in many areas of your life. So it can't just be one thing. It's really everything. You need to be organized at home, at school, uh, with your events. And we know it's a process and we've got time to learn, but that is one component of being successful is organization and keeping track of things going on. So first, label, label, label it is so important to identify the things that you have. So do you identify any belongings that you have yes or no go ahead and write that in the chat or raise your hand if you want to share how you identify or label things i like to use just labels and i use a sharpie and write on things that are mine donnie said no he does not label and you guys these these answers might be a little bit longer. So if you have something more than just like a sentence or a word or two you want to tell us raise your hand and we can unmute you too um, if you have any questions or have something that you want to tell us how you label something specifically. So right now I'm organizing a, my baby's nursery and I have labels on everything. There's a sock box. There's a hat <laughs> box. I love labels. <laughs> Someone said they use braille labels. Those are great. I love braille labels. Any of our Braille users, how do you keep track of your clothes? How do you know which clothes are what? Good 
there's a lot of different ways to keep track of clothes and to label them. I'm curious. Different drawers for different kinds of clothes. And a lot of this stuff goes for both sighted and non-sighted people. I have all my stuff sorted. There's a sock drawer, there's an underwear drawer, there's a shorts drawer, a t-shirt drawer. So I know exactly what I'm going for when I open any drawer. Great, so let's get into it. Our first subject is clothes or materials with fabric. There are lots of ways to label them. Uh, you can use iron on patches. You can use different size safety pins, braille clothes labels. These are really cool. If you know how to sew or know somebody that does sew, you can sew these into the labels of your clothes and they'll say the color of the item. Um, so that way you can easily pick out what you're gonna wear and how they can match. You can use craft paint. This is another easy one. If you use craft paint, you could put a shape or a dot on a clothing label. You just have to make sure that it dries and it usually takes about a day or so. Velcro, um, Velcro is so versatile and you can use it in so many things. So putting Velcro on a label uh, could help you organize materials. Laundry markers or buttons. They make buttons that are different shapes and sizes and you can sew those. Um, or if you find a really good glue that can put up with the washing machine, you can maybe glue them onto labels. And really you just need to come up with your own system for the things that aren't the braille clothing labels. So if you know that a square button is a green shirt, you know that all of the square buttons that you find are green, or if you signify that the circle button is for red shirts or for red clothing. So just come up with your own system, but these are all great options to identify your belongings and to label them. Household items. Rubber bands are so, so useful. So if you are in your pantry, you can use rubber bands on so many things. So if you have maybe two rubber bands around us, a can, what kind of can is it? You don't know, but if you have a system that two rubber bands equals green beans or a thick rubber band could equal that it's a, a can of soup, um, these can help you stay organized. So again, you just need your own system, but rubber bands are very versatile. They um, are inexpensive. They can come in different levels of thicknesses. You can get really thin ones or you can get thicker ones. So rubber bands are a great option. You can use large print labels, braille labels, bold markers, uh, texture stickers, Velcro stickers, craft tape. Um, I like using craft tape a lot. It's also called washi tape. They make it in different textures. So you may get one that could feel scratchy or a smooth one. Um, and you can just put tape on um, different containers that may feel the same in your pantry or throughout your house. Pipe cleaners, hot glue, um, container shapes also important. So maybe you, every morning you have a bowl of Fruit Loops and you know the Fruit Loops box is large, but um, dad's granola box is small and it's a little heavier. You can use container shape to identify what belongings you have in your pantry or throughout your house. Or if the containers feel the same from the store, you could put them in a separate Tupperware or other containers that you have available so that you can know what, what you have available in your pantry. Paper materials. So everybody could use paper clips, binder clips, or staples to organize different paper um, papers in your backpack or at school. You can also use braille labels, large print labels, bold markers, tactile stickers, colored stickers, folders, binders, envelopes. Um, the possibilities are really endless. So however your system is, if you put all of your math materials in one binder and then organize it for, further by using paper clips for each chapter, that's an option. So really whatever works for you, but there are so many different ways that you can stay organized and label your belongings. And then some bonus ones are the pen friend label and the Voxcom 3 voice labels. So these are electronics that have recording abilities and they have a label that you can put on materials and you can record your own voice saying what the item is. So there are lots of options. Did I miss anything, Jen, that you can think of? 
The only one that came to mind when we were talking about paper was the paper dividers. So if you have things for classes, you can put braille labels on the dividers and then you can put math class. And then that way you're not carrying around eight different divide or eight different binders with you, but you have different sections to make sure all your stuff is staying organized. And then we also had N NFC tags. So you could have an NFC reader that could read out to you. Oh yeah, that's a great option too. Someone said they're responsible for their own room and laundry. They also cook for their family one time a week. <laughs> so they've got to be really organized to make sure that they've got all that ready. <laughs> and containers can help too. Now that I'm thinking about it, if you're cooking and you need different measurements or measuring spoons or things like that, if you have all of your measuring devices in one container in a drawer um, and so on, that can help. So containers or boxes, lots of options to stay organized. I get excited talking about this part. <laughs> So next, organize by type. We talked about all the ways that you can label things. So now we need to talk about how to organize them. So first, place like things with like things. So what I mean is clothing style. Put all your t-shirts in one drawer. Or if you're like me, I don't like folding clothes. I hang all of my clothes. I put all my t-shirts in one area. The next to them, I put my long sleeve shirts. And then I put my dresses. And believe it or not, I even hang my pants. <laughs> so organize by the type of clothing that you have. And this will save you time in the morning or the night before if you're trying to find a certain shirt, but everything's all mixed together. It's going to take a lot longer than if you just know exactly where to go. You can organize things by food category. So in your pantry, uh, if you have snacks on one um, spot of the cabinet in a basket or on a shelf that you can organize things that way, breakfast items, snacks, pasta. And I'm sure a lot of this is already done at your house, like in the fridge. Um, there are drawers already built in in the fridge that you can organize things with. So I personally have a drawer that just has cheese in it and then a drawer that has vegetables in it and a drawer that has fruit in it. So you might already be doing this, but if you want, you can step it up a level. Yeah, they make food organizers now too that are really great in the fridge. They're like areas for sodas and you can sort things by if that you use yogurts and that kind of stuff. They have these little clear plastic containers that really just keep help help keep everything organized and together. I've been wanting to get those. Those look really cool. It seems like it'd really help things stay in place. And so you're not trying to dig behind other things. You can just pull the drawer, or the basket out for those. So that would be a great option. You can also place like things with like things for the type of activity. So um, say all your sports materials, if you play tennis and you have a racket in one cap in one, um, closet and then you have the tennis balls in your garage it would make sense to keep those things together because you use them together the same thing for when and where you use the item so if you um would like to organize all your chargers by in one area you can but for me it doesn't make sense to do that i like to keep my computer charger on my desk because i use my computer there and i keep my phone charger uh, next to my bed because i charge my phone at night so think about when you use the item and where you use it and where it makes the most sense to keep those things. And seasonal items is another option. So uh, maybe all your winter clothes are in one area. And then when it's past winter and not cold, you don't have to wear those anymore. You know, they're kind of tucked away and they're not just out where you could be using that space for something else. So organizing by type is a great way to get things going so that you can be successful and know where things are at. My when and where stuff that I organize differently is underneath my kitchen sink, I have the stuff that I clean like my living room and kitchen with. But then in my bathroom, I also keep another whole stack of cleaning stuff that I usually just use in my bathroom. So that why am I gonna lug everything from one end of my house to the other to go clean my bathroom when I can have them separated because I don't really use my bathroom stuff in the kitchen. So while they're all cleaning supplies, you may have multiple different areas that you keep little boxes of cleaning supplies and that kind of stuff too. Definitely. So some tips and tricks. It, first, if it will save you time later, do it now. I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but really it does help. If it will save you time later, go ahead and just do what you need to do now and put the things away that you need to. Um, put things away directly after you use them. 
Also, make sure all of your belongings have a home or somewhere to go. So for example, all of my books have a home. They all go on the bookshelf. Um, and that helps me know where things are going and where to put them. Also, this is one of my favorite tricks. So if it takes less than a minute to put something away or do something, I do it right away. So I know when I come in the door, I always want to just put my jacket on the table, but I really should put it in the closet. So I've started doing that. And I know it's something little, but it adds up after a while. So it takes me one minute then versus at the end of the week, I have 30 different things to do that all take a minute. That would be a half hour of my time. So if it takes less than a minute to do or put away, it helps when you do it just then. So does anybody have any comments about that? Is there something that you do that takes less than a minute that you do every time? Has anyone heard that before? Go ahead and raise your hand or put it in the chat. I hadn't heard that before, but I like that rule. But my thing is putting my keys away. I happen to walk. Sorry, my mic stopped working. I happen to walk past my key ring every time with my keys in my hand, and I just need to go back and put them on the hook that is right there for them because that takes me no time at all. <laughs> I do it with making my bed too. I, you know, I wake up in the morning and it's really not what I want to do, but I know it takes me less than a minute. So I just go ahead and do it. And then I have a better day and it's something that I don't have to do later. Does anyone have any tricks like that? I'd love to hear it or something maybe you could start doing, you know, yes or no, or raise your hand. Yep. If y'all raise your hands, we're welcome to unmute you guys. I also do it with my shoes. Sometimes I'm not the best, but I have a pile of shoes at my front door. But I know if, when I come in the door, it takes me less than a minute to put it away. Someone said they like your idea that if it takes less than a minute, go ahead and do it now. <laughs> Thank right, you. Got a hand raised. Let me unmute them. Go ahead. All right, guess not. Okay, well, if you want to write in the chat, we can get to it later. <coughs> so quick knowledge check. Have you learned anything about organizing things in your home yet? Yes or no, maybe. If you want to get more specific, you can put what you've learned about organizing things in your home. Or if you have other tricks even. Someone said, yes, they've learned something. Thank you. Um, they want to repeat that. Yes, let me. You can go ahead and unmute Robin. Or I may, do I have the wrong Robin named Bridges? Is that what's wrong? There you go. Can you hear us now? Yep, we sure can. There we go. Grand Saicon. Okay, so a trick that I usually do is I usually put devices on one corner of my desk and like devices that are charging on the other and of course chargers like in the middle of the desk. That's awesome. So uh, by the way, could I please tell you about a trick that I usually do? At Absolutely. Um, so by the way, my parents made me this some show me to put my braces and my shoes in. And then it also made me have another shelf like to put my phone in and my charge cords in. And like I usually do that. And that's how I keep my phone, charge cords for my headphones and phone, and my braces and shoes organized. 
Awesome. How about canes? Do you guys have to use a technique to keep canes organized? I just thought about that. That's something you definitely don't want to get lost in space. Yeah. Same. Well, what up here, I put it on. on her, but, but, um, I, I have four arm crutches to walk, so I don't exactly need a cane. Gotcha. How I'd organize my form, my form purchase is that usually, usually whenever there's a space, like a counter or something, I'd put my form cartridge like up on that, on the side of that counter, like just propped up. That's a great strategy. If it's somewhere that you put every time after you're using it and it works for you, that's perfect. Is there anyone else at the high school that would like to share or should we keep going? Oh, I have a trick. Let's hear it. Um, I keep my gi on the, on the shelf in the residences. Um, and I keep it organized. Great. As long as it works for you, that's what's important. If you have a system that you know where you put things, that's the first step to being organized and to being successful. <sighs> Thank All right, you guys. Bridges, let's have you guys um, mute for just a minute and then John Paul raise his hand to say something too. All right, I've allowed you mic access. Go ahead and unmute John Paul. <clears throat> I have my schoolwork is organized, but I have an organizer for my closet. Awesome. That's great. I should have mentioned that in the PowerPoint. Organizers in the closet are very popular and they definitely help keep things where they should. So thank you for sharing that. It's hard for me to understand how to dress well. Um, yeah, it, that's a hard concept to get. Um, but as you keep organized, it makes mm -hmm. it easier to find the nice clothes that you need. Well, we pick out outfits on Sunday. For oh, the week. perfect! I, mom, saying. <laughs> yeah, you guys work together and make your outfits for the week, so you can just get yourself dressed in the mornings. Yes. That's a great idea. I love that organization. I wish I was that proactive and did things early so I wasn't scrambling every morning looking for my clothes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for sharing. You. I loved hearing what everybody had to say about how they already organize things. So we've talked about organizing our events in our daily life, and we've talked about organizing our physical life and things that we have at home. So now we need to talk about how to be organized at school by studying successfully. So study skills are an important part of life on how to be successful. And everybody has different ways to study successfully. And there are some important study skills that we can have and that we can talk about. And believe it or not, the first one is organization. <laughs> We've talked a lot about organization, but there is more to say. Time management skills, note-taking skills, and knowing your learning type are all ways to help you, make, help you be successful. So organization, like we said, use a planner so you know when your due dates are. If you're organized and know when things are due, it will help with your stress level and getting assignments completed. Know where all of your school and study materials are located. So if you're wasting or using 10, 15 minutes to find everything before you even get started studying, you're gonna be um, behind already or it's gonna take you longer. You may get tired quicker. So if you keep all of your school materials at your desk or if you have a certain spot that you do your homework every day or you study, um, keep it there and know where they're at so that you can easily find them and that you're not uh, spending time looking for what you need. 
organize your school materials using things like binders or folders. Um, it's kind of what we touched on. A binder with dividers would be great. And then once you do organize those materials, you can go a step further and organize them by subject, unit, chapter, whatever makes the most sense and works for you. And you know, some classes may have a syllabus or a rule of how you organize a composition notebook or a binder. So your teachers may have strategies too of how they prefer to have things organized. Oops. Um, so there's lots of ways to be organized to help with your studying. So knowing where things are at, um, using that planner, and then keeping your materials organized where you know they are. Our next area is time management. So time management, schedule times to study. Makes it easy if you already have it in your calendar. If you get notified that, hey, in 15 minutes, you've got a 30 minute block or a 10 minute block that you wanted to study for a subject. Um, it makes it so that you, you're already prepared and you know what's coming. Study a little every day so that you don't have to wait until the last day to cram it all in. I'm sure everybody's guilty of this happening a couple times, but really if you study 10, 15 minutes every day for something, you've studied that much longer. And then the night before the test or the exam, you won't be stressed trying to study for hours on end. Um, this will really help you with being prepared for things. If you do a little bit every day, just like cleaning your room or staying organized at home, do a little bit every day and then you won't have to do it all at once. Be realistic about how long it will take you to do something. If you know that it will take you 20 minutes to read a chapter, make sure that you have 20 minutes to read that chapter. So if you're scheduling a time to do homework, make sure you schedule the enough time that you need to do the assignment correctly and to do it fully. So being organized with your time is a crucial factor to be successful in school. Also, you can use a timer. So you can have scheduled breaks at regular intervals. If you work best, if you schedule 10 minutes at a time to study and you give yourself a two minute break to stretch or to go get a glass of water, just to, or a break just to sit and not think about it, use that, use a timer. You can set one on your microwave, on your phone, on your computer um, with Alexa. There's lots of options for that. And the same thing with when you start, just set a timer for when you need to be done by. And then you know when that timer goes off, you're done for the night. So we also have to be successful with note-taking to be a good studier. It's important to take notes during class that include the date, subject, and the chapter or unit. And the reason I included chapter or unit because if you have all your notes that say math, um, but you don't include what chapter they are and it comes time to take that test and the, chap the test is on chapters seven to nine, and they aren't labeled, you could be studying things that won't even be on the exam. So be specific about the notes that you're taking. The same thing with labeling them on your computer. Um, title the document, um, the chapter or the lesson and the date that you took those notes. Listen to and write down things that your teacher repeats several times. If they're repeating it more than once, it's probably important and it's something that you wanna remember and write down. If you aren't sure what something means or you need clarification, ask a question. That's what the teachers are there for. They're happy to help. So if you aren't sure or you didn't hear something or you just needed a little more explanation, go ahead and raise your hand and ask those questions so that you can take better notes and know the material more. Use known abbreviations if that saves you time writing or typing. Just like with contracted Braille, um, if you're typing on the computer, you could use known abbreviations so that you know what you're doing and saves you time writing. If it's hard to read your handwriting, consider typing it. Um, I'm guilty of this sometimes. <laughs> My handwriting is not the neatest. So uh, if I know I'm writing a lot during the day, I may end up typing because I'm a little more efficient at that. And I know that I won't have to struggle to read it later. 
compare notes with a friend. Sometimes they may have caught something that you didn't, or if you had gotten up to use the restroom or anything, um, you may have missed something or they may have missed something and you can use the opportunity to share your notes with each other. And use your accommodations. If you have note-taking assistance or preferential seating, go ahead and use it. That's what they're there for. And don't overdo it. Sometimes you may want to write everything down that your teacher is saying, but sometimes it's best just to get what you need to and not write every single thing down. So lastly, know your learning type. Are you an auditory learner? There's different strategies that you can use to help you study. Uh, record yourself reading your notes and listen to them later. Record your teacher's lesson so you can play it back later for studying. And if you do this, make sure you get permission from the teacher that you can record. Listen to the audiobook. Read aloud and repeat the study guide. Ask others to quiz you. Talk through things with others. Another learning type is a visual learner. If you're a visual learner, color code or highlight important facts. Picture what you read. Look at the pictures first and then read the passage. Use flashcards, use graphs, charts, or outlines. Read the question first, then read the passage, then answer the questions. Another learning type is kinesthetic learner. If you're a kinesthetic learner, use real objects or make a replica of what you're studying. Act out or perform a skit of what you're studying. Use hand gestures to remember facts. Study and then take a physical break and repeat. Teach others what you know. Chew gum, that one may seem silly, but if you're a learner that needs to be moving or doing something, chewing gum could help you stay focused and remember what you're studying. And then lastly, you could be a combination of all three. So if you're a combination learner, use learning strategies from auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learners. So I wanna know what type of learner are you? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or combination? Go ahead and write that in the chat. V for visual, A for auditory, K for kinesthetic, or C for combination. We've got one visual learner, an A and a V. So knowing what type of learner can really help you be a more efficient studier and be more successful. And if you aren't sure, you can try different things out and see what works the best for you. Okay, I'm gonna keep on rolling because we only have a minute or two left. So at the beginning, we asked how organized you think you could be. <laughs> Um, before we went through all of these wonderful tools that you could be. So think to yourself, using that scale of one to five, how organized do you think you could be now? I know we had a wide variety. So think to yourself and rate your skills about all the things that you learned today. Someone said they can be a five now. Great. If you guys hear the screen reader, that is our host, Scott, coming back on probably to tell us that we got to get off in just a minute. Um, so we got a three fours and a five. That's awesome. I feel like We're those are moving a, little on up a little Yeah. So before we get off, I just wanted to quickly mention our extension activity. So with all the things that we learned today about being organized and being successful for school, I would love if you guys could challenge yourself and organize your school materials. This could be your backpack, your desk, your locker. I think personally, I'm probably going to organize the trunk of my car because it has seen better days. I think I could use some of these strategies myself. And next week, we will be back on Wednesday and we're learning about technology and how to keep our lives organized and flowing. And I think we are all finished, guys. Thank you for being such great listeners and for responding.
All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Amber. This was amazing. I wish I would have had this a couple of years ago. This is fantastic. And again, just a reminder to think about next week at this time for low and high tech items that'll keep you organized, as was mentioned. Thank you so much for attending the APH um, Virtual Excel Academy, and we will see you all very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye, guys. See you Bye. next week.